Welcome back. We're going to be talking about a few different things. First up, tricky procedures in wars, storms, and celebrities. Oh my. Okay, well, speaking of tricky, uh, it's a little tricky to get this batter in just right without spilling. Uh, let's try to, oh, I think I got it there. Yeah, yeah, nice. All right. Well, first up is my 15 minutes of fame, flattening a prime minister's retina by Dr. Richard Packard out of the UK. Sounds pretty interesting. Number two, performing surgery during stressful situations by Dr. William Trattler out of Florida. And finally, the world's largest series in terms of pellet ocular trauma, operating during civil strife in Kashmir by Professor Dr. S. Natarajan. Let's get cooking. My 15 minutes of fame, flattening a prime minister's retina. I have no financial interest in this talk. It was Andy Warhol, the pop artist, who in 1968 said, in the future, everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. My story starts in 1970 as a newly qualified doctor at the Middlesex Hospital in London, where I started a relationship with one of the physiotherapy students, Sally Henderson. Her father, John, was a family doctor, and we became good friends despite my no longer being involved with Sally. It also so happened that he was Margaret Thatcher's doctor. In 1982, at the age of 56, Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister, wanted some reading glasses for the first time. She said to John Henderson, send me to an ophthalmologist who's likely to outlive me. She came to see me in November, only one month after I was appointed a consultant in Windsor. I was very nervous, but all went well, thankfully. On Sunday, July the 31st, the following year, after I came back from walking my Yorkshire Terrier algae, I discovered that John Henderson had rung to say that the Prime Minister had flashes and floaters in her right eye for the past three days. He asked if I could come and see her at his cottage near Henley. So I went to the hospital, I connected an indirect ophthalmoscope and some drops, and off I went. When I examined her, there was a large upper temporal u tear in her right eye, but at that stage, no subretinal fluid, and it looked rather like this. I said that it might be possible to surround the tear with laser to avoid surgery, which she was quite keen on, but that I would have to check her in three days, and if there had been any deterioration, then she would require formal surgery. So we all proceeded to the hospital to do the laser. Me in front, in my Fiat Panda, the Prime Minister's security and their Land Rover Discovery, the Prime Minister and her Daimler Double Six, and behind us all, John Henderson in his BMW 525. We went to the King Edward VII Hospital in Windsor. I alerted the ward sister that we would need to take over the laser room, having kept everybody outside until things were clear. I went in there with the Prime Minister and I put a series of argon laser burns around the tear, hoping that this would be sufficient. Downing Street initially did not inform the press as to what had been going on until Monday evening, that is the day after we did the laser treatment. But on Tuesday morning, the story broke in the press. In the Times, there was a story that Thatcher may face an operation on her eye, Highlighted here, we've got a description of posterior vitreous detachment for the benefit of the, uh, the lay public. And also they were saying that the success rate of retinal detachment surgery was 93%. The following day, the Times had a story, Dr. Optimistic on Thatcher's Eye. Now this wasn't me, this was John Henderson. And he said that if a minor operation was necessary, the use of lasers was possible. And this would involve only a local anaesthetic. Just shows all he knew. In fact, that particular day that I was going to be seeing the Prime Minister later on, I was doing a clinic at Moorfield Eye Hospital, High Hoban. And when I came out, there was press everywhere because they had gone to all the branches of, uh, of Moorfields to see if they could get a, an opinion from an eye doctor. So as I came out, one of the uh, 
journalist came up to see me and said that, um, did I know what was going on with the Prime Minister? Was I an ophthalmologist? So I said, well, yes, I was an ophthalmologist, but I really couldn't make any comment. I didn't know what was going on. You can imagine how he felt when he discovered uh, later on in the day or possibly the next day that I was the surgeon who was going to be operating on the Prime Minister. I had arranged with the Prime Minister that she would come and see me in Harley Street at my rooms there, 128 Harley Street, and that I would examine her at about two o'clock, which I duly did. When I had a look at her eye, I found the following that she had her upper temporal root tear that I knew about. I could see that there were some laser uh, shots around it, all the way around, but unfortunately, there was now some subretinal fluid which was lifting off the lasered area. And I said to her, look, I'm really sorry, but the laser has not been sufficient. If we don't operate as quickly as we can, then it is quite possible that the retina will fully detach and it will have an effect in your vision on the long term. So she agreed that uh, she would come for surgery and that she didn't want it done in London. And we'd arranged that if it was going to be necessary, she would come down to Princess Christian's Hospital in Windsor, which is where I do my private surgery. I'd already alerted my team at King Edward VII Hospital that we would be uh, possibly having to do this. They had all the equipment ready and we just said, OK, let's go on and do it. I carried out the Prime Minister's surgery that evening, starting at about half past seven and we finished about half past eight. The surgery was done at HRS Princess Christian's Hospital, which is the private hospital I used in Windsor. The name came from Princess Helena Victoria, who was a daughter of Queen Victoria, and she married Prince Christian Victor of Schleswig-Holstein. This is where the name came from. As far as the surgery was concerned, I put a radial uh, sponge plomb on the eye over the area of the break, having localised it and having put some cryopexy onto it. I also felt the need to release some subretinal fluid because the uh, implant itself didn't seem to be sufficient to close the tear. I was obviously in the theatre with the, the Prime Minister and the surgery was being done under general anaesthetic, so we had an anaesthetist there. John Henderson was in the corner worrying that I was going to be able to do this all right. And then outside, there were the PM's protection officers waiting to make sure I did a good job. When we started the surgery, nobody, that is the press, knew where we were in Windsor. However, somebody did tip off the press from my building in Harley Street in London. However, I was able to leave the hospital after, after surgery undetected. By the next morning, however, it was all over the press and TV. On the day after the surgery, August the 4th, the Times had a nice picture of John Henderson and uh, Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister. This was obviously taken from stock because uh, there was no picture that day that could possibly be like this. There was also a description about what might have been done to seal the uh, and deal with the tear in the Prime Minister's retina. A number of the other papers also reported the story. Sometimes they were a little bit more dramatic than others. The Daily Telegraph just said that she'd had an operation after the failure of the laser treatment. The Sun, always more dramatic, said Maggie battles for her sight. And the Daily Mail, which is always a supporter of the Conservative Party, like the Telegraph, said successful IOP for Maggie. Although how they actually knew that at that stage, I don't really know. On the morning after the surgery, <clears throat> I went in to see the Prime Minister. On the way in, nobody recognised me. However, by the time I came out, this was a different story. But I was able to report, having been stopped by uh, press and TV and having to get out of my car in order to talk to them, that the Prime Minister was doing well, that she had good vision, and I was very happy, and so was Dennis Thatcher, her husband. Although I was on the lunchtime and evening news, I didn't get into the press, or at least my name didn't get into the press or any pictures of me until the following day. And here we can see the Times and the Daily Mail of August 5th with pictures of Dennis Thatcher looking extremely pleased. 
and certainly so was I. They were very optimistic stories and uh, certainly the, you would have thought that this was all the people had to worry about. However, the Conservative Party, the Tories, had got a bit upset because the Prime Minister had not appointed somebody to mind the shop while she was actually recovering from her surgery or while she was actually under the anaesthetic. That same day, the 5th of August, the Prime Minister's son Mark came to visit her in hospital. When he came out of her room, he said to me, Richard, mother's very happy and she says you can have product endorsement. Well, that was pretty pleasing, I suppose. On the following day, Saturday, the 6th of August, I went to see my patient and tell her that she could leave hospital. After this, I went shopping in the supermarket and discovered what my 15 minutes of fame actually meant. People actually recognised me and said hi, and they wanted to know how the Prime Minister was. It was extraordinary. The Sunday papers reported the Prime Minister's discharge from hospital. You could see her smiling with her dark glasses on because she didn't normally wear glasses for distance. By this stage, she'd already requested as to when she could start work and had already seen one load of uh, red dispatch boxes with all her um, Prime Minister's papers in. Anyway, she went off very happily to Chequers, the uh, Prime Minister's country residence. On Monday, August the 8th, one week after the original story in the Times, I went to see the Prime Minister at Chequers to see how she was getting on. The story now had moved on from the operation itself to the Prime Minister being irritated by talks of succession and what should or shouldn't have been done while she was recovering from surgery. Anyway, I was very happy because she was doing well. Her vision had returned to her pre PVD level and all seemed to be going well. And as far as reporting the whole matter of the Prime Minister and her operation was concerned, I even made it, made it into Private Eye, our best known satirical magazine in the UK. And in the second paragraph, as you can see here from the uh, supposed letter from Schloss Bangelstein, it said a second doctor wheeled in a very smooth little booper chap called Pankhurst or some such name. His lime being a simple little op, he does 50 of them a week. Nice quiet clinic in the back streets of Windsor. Very tasty food. Same butcher as the castle. Far from prying eyes of Fleet Street, he'd have her in and out in a couple of days and no one would be any the wiser. Well, just shows how wrong you can be. I continued to see Lady Thatcher, as she became after her resignation in 1990, for nearly 30 years. We became quite good friends with her and her husband, Dennis. They would come to our house occasionally. We would go and see them. We were invited to Lady Thatcher's 70th birthday party and we went to their golden wedding celebration as well. Sadly, dementia took hold in her last years and the last time we spoke was at a Kuwait National Day event and she could not remember who I was. From my point of view, what did my 15 minutes of fame mean? Well, patients came from all over the world so I had much to be grateful for for my friendship with John Henderson. And above all, I was privileged to have known Margaret Thatcher, a quite remarkable woman. So thank you for your attention. And if fate deems it possible that you might be famous for 15 minutes, enjoy it, because it really doesn't come too often in one's life. Hi. I'm Bill Trattler from Miami, Florida, and I'm presenting to you on performing surgery during stressful situations. This is part of the Cake and Pie Expo in June 2021. Again, I'm Bill Trattler. I'm from the Center for Excellence in Eye Care in Miami, Florida. I do have some disclosures. Um, they're listed here. I don't think any are quite relevant for today's talk, but just here is an updated list. So clearly, we're excited to be here, and I'm sure just like you, I love ophthalmology, it's clearly the best profession. I'm not sure if you're aware, but my father, uh, Henry Chatter, is an ophthalmologist, so I grew up with a, with a leader in the family who was um, an ophthalmologist, and so I was always interested in ophthalmology. And then my wife, um, Jennifer Lowe, is also an ophthalmologist, um, so it's really fun that we get to spend a lot of time talking about ophthalmology all the time. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about 
uh, how we manage some of the more challenging uh, situations in our profession, but uh, just uh, having this nice background has been helpful. Now, what, one of my favorite procedures is cataract surgery, and I was fortunate that I had wonderful training. Uh, I trained at Shea Institute at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and then spent an extra year with Jim McCulley and, uh, and the rest of the professors at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. So I feel like I was very lucky to have some great training, um, and I also had a chance to work with uh, residents teaching uh, early in my career, which really made a big impact. And through all these uh, steps, you kind of learn how to be successful with cataract surgery, but it's really also about managing stress. And because there's always been situations that can be stressful, whether it's you doing surgery or you're supervising as a professor teaching uh, younger doctors, and it's how you manage stress in more challenging situations that's key. And of course, you know, we're, we're you know, have so many important uh, aspects uh, in our hands where managing stress is critical. We also look towards the professionals who really have tons of stress as well. And in the US, um, basketball is one of the biggest and, and um, uh, but also one of the more stressful um, uh, types of sports because every shot, every uh, ball handle can be quite stressful. And I'm just sharing uh, as a Miami, uh, I guess, living in Miami my, my, uh, most of my uh, life, uh, we're big fans of the Miami Heat. And uh, in the championship, uh, you know, the heat of one of a couple championships, but this was a scenario you can see in this picture here where uh, one of our top players uh, was asked to make a shot. They were down by three points. There's 7.1 seconds left um, and we're down three to two. So if the game, if he doesn't make the shot, basically the season's over, uh, the, the chances for a title's over. You can see here, um, this is Ray Allen uh, who just catches the ball with all these people coming around him, just takes the ball, takes this long shot, is able just to sink the shot, tie the game up and he'd end up winning that game and go on to win the series in the, in the NBA championship. And so how does he like, you know, that moment he gets the ball and how is he really able to take away all the stresses and just perform like he's been training? And obviously we're, uh, you know, he has a lot of practice, but we'll talk about how we as surgeons can do these the same aspects. And, you know, whether we're talking about basketball, we're talking about golf, tennis, all those different sports that are out there, you all may be excellent uh, uh, athletes and do certain things and you know how stress can impact things and how managing stress can make you better athletes. Um, so just here's a couple of overviews on, uh, as we as physicians and how we can really excel in surgery by preparing both mentally and physically. And so some of these are to have complete and deliberate focus. And what that means is, and we're going to more detail in these, but just really be able to concentrate in the moment, um, not be distracted. Um, you wanna be confident. So that's another critical thing is that um, you've been trained, even if you're doing in a scenario that you've never been in before, you have to have confidence in yourself to be able to get yourself through that and get your patient to a safe spot. Um, you need to manage your emotions, whether, uh, and key is to try to maintain a positive attitude, try to avoid negative thoughts when things don't go the way they are and manage anxiety effectively. And one of the keys is to really enjoy what you're doing. If you love what you're doing, like I love cataract surgery, maybe you love retina surgery, maybe you love plastic surgery, whatever you love, the key is if you love it and really enjoy it, um, then you go to work and even when it's stressful, it's like you're excited and you're really making a big impact on patients' lives. And so that makes a big impact is your attitude and how you're feeling and enjoying what you're doing is key. Um, so let's just talk about um, stress. So obviously there's a lot of steps that can be quite stressful during cataract surgery. Even in routine cases, there can be stressful moments, but, but obviously things don't always go perfectly, so that can be even more stressful. And so the key is managing stress, because if you can manage stress, you can really uh, give your patient really the, you know, the best outcome possible. And they may not have a perfect outcome, because there may be things that are beyond your control and my control, things just didn't go the way that was expected. But if you can manage stress and get through the surgery and get them to the best point possible, that's your role as a, as a surgeon, and that's what we're trying to do. So the key is really called complete and, complete and deliberate focus. What that means is you're immersing yourself. You're really focused. You're, you're, you're watching, you're paying attention. You're trying to understand what's going on in the situation, how you can get to the next step. Um, you really want to focus on what matters most. And you try not to uh, be distracted by, by people talking, uh, by music or anything else that could be going on, by the patient maybe having a little discomfort. You know, they're, you know, you just have to, which of course you don't want, but you have to, if you're in a situation where you need to really, you know, it's critical and you just have to really focus and, and help get to the next step, it's a safe spot. Um, try to also anticipate the next step. Anticipation of the next step is critical in all the things that we do, um, you know, whether it's surgery, thinking about life in general. Uh, for athletes, uh, if you're a skier, if you, uh, you're, you know, the skiers are looking for the moguls on the hill, they're not looking at their feet and what they're skiing on now, they're looking two or three turns ahead. And so we wanna look forward to the next step. You've, you've done a, a step, um, you know, if you put a viscoelastic in the eye uh, in preparation for the next step, like how you're gonna put a viscoelastic in, what type of viscoelastic you're gonna use is, is key to being successful. And try not to get bummed out or upset about issues that occurred early in the case. So let's say that you're trying to make you know, a perfect capsulotomy, um, but you know, for some reason during that capsulotomy, the patient had a little type of movement and um, you kind of lost a little bit. So now it's not a, a perfectly round capsulotomy. Um, or let's say you developed an anterior capsular tear, whatever little issue developed, you don't get upset about what happened before. Just focus on where you are now and how you can continue to help this patient get through to the next step. Um, so again, complete and deliberate focus is one of the keys to success. Um, 
again, going to sports, NFL kick kickers are a perfect example. You know, even if they miss a critical kick, um, either earlier in the game or the game before, they're going to show up again and they're going to do the 110%. They have to block out their last bad kick and just focus and give the best kick that they can to really help uh, their team win. So obviously, as we talk about stress, stressfulness, um, another thing that can really help is being confident. So confidence really um, helps or really comes from practice. So practice can be hands-on, you're practicing doing lots of cases. It can be watching surgical video and watching presentations like this one or other ones and learning so that you understand what's, what, where you're at and how to help. Uh, practice can also be supervising. So when you're with other doctors and watching them operate and helping you know, them and if, if they're you know, with ideas or suggestions, but for practice, is not just always just you doing more surgery. It's not your total volume. It's really the whole thought process around, uh, around um, you know, cataract surgery and all the things that you learn. Um, continue learning is critical. So watching those videos, watching new techniques, new steps. Maybe you never learned how to do chopping and you want to learn how to chop. And so it, that helps you in a situation where the cataract is really dense and you're kind of stuck and it, there's some endothelial issues and you watch those videos and you're gonna do a modified chop of what you've watched, um, you know, and again, being confident is key because all this practice, study, experience and continue learning will help you be more confident and give a, and really help give the best care to your patients. Um, again, uh, when you go to professional athletes, um, again, thinking about the, uh, any of the sports, I mean, they're practicing, they're going to the gym, they're working out, and they're really practicing every single day. So, you know, we as, as surgeons taking care of patients, it's really our, 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 our goal is to really give the best care and be confident that it takes practice, uh, both mentally and physically. Um, also, managing your emotions is key. So, um, it can be stressful. You know, you, you're doing surgery and, and maybe things aren't going the way that you expected, but you have to maintain that positive attitude. Um, even during the most difficult steps, you notice that the Zondyls may be a little loose. You're doing, you know, you're trying to remove the, the nucleus, and you're worried that, you know, that are you going to be successful here? But try to just have a positive attitude. Do one step at a time. Sometimes slowing down can be helpful, but try to have that positive attitude. Um, when things again are going, not going the right way, try to avoid the negative thoughts that can lead to a downward spiral. Spiral. You want to really again have a positive attitude um, and maintain uh, manage your anxiety effectively. Um, just again, when when things aren't going the way you want, slow down, pause, get to a safe spot. And then stepwise go from where you are and figure out what, what's best for the patient. Maybe you know there's a, a damage to the capsule so that placing the chalk lens at that time is not the best choice. Maybe it's better to leave the patient any fake it. Um, but you know, manage your anxiety, just try to figure out what's best for the patient. Um, don't get frustrated. Um, if there's iris coming out of the wound that you know there's positive pressure and, and you're worried about that, how the iris is gonna look, just slow down. Okay, what do I need to do to, to, to lower the pressure inside the eye? Maybe go through the paracentesis, burp out some wound from a different area to lower the intraocular pressure. But, Again, don't be uh, anxious, try to manage things and, and have a positive attitude. Um, I did jump there. I mean, listening to music can also be helpful for some people. So that's just another way to help manage your, your anxiety. Uh, enjoy what you're doing. I mean, this is one of my favorite things to point out. I mean, uh, cataract surgery is fun, uh, it's exciting. We are making patients see better. And that uh, camaraderie afterwards when you've helped your patient. Now, you know, immediately after surgery, they're, they're seeing maybe a little bit better, but obviously it's you know, they come back the next day, they're seeing a little better, they come back a week later, and you really, they share with you that you've changed your life. And uh, if you really just realize what a big impact you are making as a doctor, as a surgeon, caring for these patients um, and celebrate with your patients. You know, understand how um, what you've done has impacted their lives in a very positive way. If you, if you realize what a difference you're making for these patients, you will continue to work hard to try to be the best surgeon possible to try to make every case great because you realize what a big impact you're making these patients' lives. They're counting on us. I got counting on you, so that's where we can really uh, make a difference. So really enjoy what you're doing, doing is key. Let's talk about a case scenario. A posterior capsule tear occurs during nuclear removal. Um, it's very stressful. This is where a piece of nucleus can fall behind uh, the capsule. Um, we may not be able to place the plan. I well, maybe you're planning a presbyopic lens or a torque lens. Now there's a capsule tear. We can't go with, a, with the lens we were planning for. Um, you know, so it can be really challenging. But it's really about you know, you know, understand that these things happen, um, and so you should be prepared. You know, no matter how many surgeries we do. We know that there will be a situation where it doesn't go quite the way as expected. There could, there could be some positive pressure, a tear develops. And so understanding that that's going to happen, being prepared, handling that situation and moving in and figuring out the best course of action for the patient. Maybe it's likely placing a monofocal lens, maybe in the sulcus, um, and they can always come back later and put, um, you know, and do LASIK or PRK or other procedures to further help improve the, vi the uncorrected visual acuity as needed. Um, but really the key is to get to the next safe spot, safest spot and um, try to avoid issues. So, um, just be, you know, developing your skill set on how to manage, um, you know, both physically and mentally these situations is key. Um, so just gonna click a little video here. This is one of my cases. So you know, here I'm about to start the FACO, um, and then all of a sudden I realized that there was 
a loss of flow inside the eye. And so um, I'm gonna put some viscoelastic, well, put on the tourney at first, but try to go back in the eye to fill the eye again. Uh, but that's the situation where the, the, the fluid, even though I tested it and I was test prior to putting the eye, it just somehow it popped out just as I was getting started. So I was stressful and then, but I'm still going to do the whole case. And so, you know, I just tried, you know, I let, you know, I stopped, came out of the eye and then now I'm going to go forward and do the rest of the case, but not be stressed about what happened. I mean, maybe there's some uh, injury to the, to the corneal endothelium, hopefully not, um, but you can't stress about that. I got to work and, and just finish the case, do a great job for this patient um, and that can be done. So um, we know another big issue is just managing the iris. And this is Uday Devkin, who's got so many great videos, but there's a case where there's this um, iris that's coming out through the wound uh, and then understand like how we're gonna manage these type of patients is key. Um, and so I, and I do think it's one of the more challenging steps uh, or situations that, that younger doctors get into, which is when there's positive pressure, there's too much viscoelastic in the eye or positive pressure, the iris is coming out of the main wound. And you just have to you know, know what the right steps are doing. Don't try to force it back in. I usually go through the paresthesis, lower the pressure from the side port, um, and then that allows the iris to just naturally fall back in the eye when the pressure is lower. There's no positive pressure pushing out, but just knowing these steps is key. Um, so, you know, again, just saying here not to repose the iris um, because that's where you're going to damage the iris and can have some iris defects. Um, instead, you can go through the, the paracetesis and, and release some of the fluid, the viscoelastic, and that's going to lower the pressure and help this patient. Um, obviously, one of the other big challenges that we have is with the iris is you know, small pupils, and we're lucky that we have a variety of different technologies to help uh, keep the pupil open. Um, and these are just three important examples, but that can, when you have a big pupil, uh, the surgery typically go a lot better. Um, of course, um, I'm a big fan of Femto, uh, but sometimes I'll, we'll do Femto and the patient will have a situation where the people will come down even though we've, and we've performed Femto, but now the capsule is partially open. So you also have to get skilled and, and experience on how to place a metal ligand ring or, or BVI ring or capsule or hooks, sorry, um, uh, iris hooks um, and capture the iris but not the edge of the capsulotomy. And that's the key thing here. You can see that, that we are beyond the capsulotomy. So this uh, inner, inner circle is the capsulotomy and I've got, I'm working hard to get the metal ligand ring um, you know, uh, eyelets on, on the iris, attaching the iris, but avoiding the capsulotomy. Sometimes you'll still catch it, and then it happens you just uh, reposition that, that uh, part of the bionic ring or the BVI ring and, and free it up. Um, another challenging situation is, you know, we're doing cataract surgery with a toric lens, and all of a sudden at the end of uh, the removal of the viscoelastic, the viscoelastic comes from behind the lens and rotates the lens 10, 15, 20 degrees, and now we're off target. And sometimes you can reposition with the, with the IA handpiece on flow only, but sometimes it can be a little sticky and hard to work. So one other pearl we have here is that I'll place viscoelastic in the AC, one of, more of a cohesive viscoelastic. I'll reposition the lens with my Sinsky hook, and then I'll go back in with the IA handpiece, but this time, since there's no viscoelastic behind the lens, usually the lens will stay in focus. So obviously there's stresses outside of the actual procedure. Uh, Sometimes we'll have VIP patients, whether it's a family member, your own family member, maybe it's a family member of someone who works in your office, maybe it's another physician, uh, some other VIP patient. So again, you have to understand that we stress it outside the actual procedure and how to manage that stress. There can be time pressures, you know, maybe, um, you know, there's pressure because um, you're, you're an hour behind, you know, and, and you have to try to, you know, be efficient. But sometimes you have to be careful too. You don't want to go too fast. You want to just take things uh, carefully. And sometimes there will be time pressure, but try to, again, not take that um, stress, uh, you know, not to really live it during your procedure. Understand there could be a time pressure, but you're getting up with that behind you during your surgery when you focus. Um, there can be situations where you have, even though the patient's a perfect candidate for cataract surgery, they have neck issues and you just can't position them properly. So maybe a little awkward. So again, those cases you may have to, you do your best to position them. You may have to just take things a little slower during the surgery. And also emergency situations where um, let's say it's a, you know, there's an issue that developed and you have to go after hours and your team is not there. So you're working with unfamiliar people who may not be as experienced, whether it's a scrub tech or a circulator, um, so that can be definitely more, more challenging, whether it's late at night or during a natural disaster. Um, as you may be aware, I, as I mentioned, I live in Miami, Florida. So one of the natural disasters we have to worry about are hurricanes. And so we've gone through a lot of hurricanes uh, in my, I don't know to say how many years, but almost 50 years I've lived here in Miami. Um, obviously, I went away for certain years of schooling, but, but I've spent most of my life here in Miami. And so we've had some hurricanes. Um, and probably the, the most challenging one for us um, was Hurricane Andrew. This was... Um, I know it happened a while ago in Miami uh, in August of 1992. Uh, and this is a hurricane that ended up being a category five, which is the highest category and it had the highest winds uh, that I think we've ever seen in Miami that it was recorded, but I'm not a hurricane expert, but it was a really significant hurricane. And um, it just was railed right towards Miami. And sometimes they'll, they'll veer away a little bit, but this one came uh, right towards us. Uh, this example of one of the boats that ended up um, you know, way, well away from the water because uh, of the tidal surge and things like that. So again, this is quite a challenging case. And um, I was in uh, Miami at the time, of course, my dad is a practicing ophthalmologist um, and not surprising, um, there was you know, a lot of uh, eye injuries and eye challenges. So, um, you, know, you know, 
during Hurricane Andrew, which is Category 5, you can see that it was quite uh, flattened a lot of areas within Miami where just the you know, whole areas were flattened. Uh, so there's a lot of debris and there were a lot of injuries. And, and again, we, we managed um, a number of eye injuries um, and we'll talk about one now. Um, the maximum sustained speeds are 141 miles per hour. So with gusts in the 169 mile per hour range. So these are it's quite a severe hurricane. Um, and everyone took shelter, but still, you know, people's houses did get demolished or damaged. So there was a lot of issues. Um, I was, uh, my father was at, in practice at a hospital called Baptist Hospital Miami, which is one of the bigger hospitals. Um, and uh, we stayed in the, in the hospital overnight. Um, uh, uh, you know, to be prepared uh, for the next few days because we knew that it could be difficult and turn out it would be almost impossible to drive because all the trees are down and all the roads were closed for a few days. And then also the challenge was there was no uh, electricity. We had just, we were on a generator, so electricity was very minimal. Uh, we did staff the uh, emergency room and I did a lot of lacerations even though I was just finishing my training. Um, I was just starting, I was finished medical school and starting my, my internship year. Um, but we did laser, uh, laceration repair, managing a lot of different um, uh, issues. Um, in the, so last year, the eyelids, the face, arms, all different things. But you know, there was one of the patients that we had to take care of um, about a day into um, this uh, crisis was a patient that had a coronal laceration. And it's just an example of a coronal laceration. It looked like this. I don't have the exact picture from 1992. Uh, and my father, um, who I, who I you know, was, a, was a surgeon on call because we were at the same hospital, so we had to um, you know, manage this, this situation. Uh, but of course, the challenge was there was, um, at the time, there was uh, no AC or Miami in August, which is quite hot, and no running water. Um, and so, um, you know, again, you're, you as a physician have to understand that there can be all these stressful situations, uh, you know, and how do we manage it, you know, you know, and be successful with the patient. Uh, basically, you know, it was a crazy time where we had to actually scrub, there's no running water, so I had to scrub with, with, with bottled sterile water rinse. Um, you know, I, I got to assist even though um, it's a little bit earlier in my career. And uh, we were able to be successful. Um, even, uh, again, the challenges were that, you know, the nurses who were there at the time weren't very familiar with cataract surgery. They knew enough and they were able to help, but you had to be patient, understand that you know, this is going to be a little slower procedure than normal. Uh, we're going to go step by step, make, make sure you have the right equipment to begin with, uh, make sure that everyone's familiar with what to expect during the procedure. Um, and again, try to you know, get everybody in a very positive attitude, even though it's stressful, people are anxious, they're anxious about so many different things, because, you know, again, you just had a natural disaster, but really focus and try to help the patient, which was a quite a successful procedure. Um, so in summary, I hope this is very helpful as I share with you some of the pearls of, for success with cataract surgery. Um, you know, I think preparing mentally and physically is one of the key steps, and you can uh, go to conferences as well. You can go to, you can enjoy these online videos and, and online uh, conferences like the Pie uh, and Cake Expo that we're here with today. Um, but Again, spending time learning how to really uh, focus and uh, learning steps and skills within character is quite critical. Um, obviously, being successful in character, what I've observed is maybe the most challenging issue can be the iris because you can get you know overpressurization, iris prolapse. If people can come down, making the surgery more difficult. So, um, understanding uh, uh, keys on managing the iris is one of the, the key steps for us as surgeons to be successful with cataract surgery. I can't thank enough my family for their support, um, and I always love seeing you all live meetings and looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you so much. Thanks to the Keck and Pie for uh, the, the session. So I'm giving a talk on pellet ocular trauma and uh, in one of the journal it was written as a pot. And uh, so this is a, a thanks to my colleagues who are, we are writing, trying to write the article. Thanks to Rupesh Agarwal, Tariq Qureshi, Dr. Per Perves, Dr. Sabeya, Dr. Arshi and Dr. Ang Bran. So the, there's no finance, uh, financial disclosure. So this study reports uh, the incidents and uh, incidents, clinical findings and management of 777 patients with pellet gun related ocular injuries occurred during widespread violence in Kashmir region from June to November 2016. So there are more than 1000 injuries, uh, ophthalmic injuries, but we have selected 777 to analyze and write. So ocular trauma imposes a significant impact on the globe, uh, global health. So this is my uh, beautiful Kashmir which is like a Switzerland of India and uh, reaching out to the helpless pellet victims in Kashmir. So the pellet gun this is there covered and you can see there are, it's a, in a cartridge, there are about 400 pellets, which goes, which is about a four into four, uh, like a polygon shape. So the whole uh, uh, Srinagar was in curfew. In India, we, when you say curfew, that means no public is allowed to come out and you can see the uh, police and the military, which is controlling the place and a totally deserted place. But suddenly you see the fighting uh, uh, people come with stones and throw on the police or the military. And then because to protect themselves, they have to retaliate by uh, using the pellet gun. 
and I you saw that recently in the U.S. they use the rubber gun, and uh, the uh, Dr. Ann, uh, the president of American Academy of Ophthalmology, mentioned about the article, and also Ravi Goel, who's a trustee of American Academy of uh, Ophthalmology. So these are the victims affected by pellet injury, and due to the overwhelming number of victims, Borderless World Foundation, a non-governmental organization, invited me to visit Sri Maharaja Hari Singh Hospital, a tertiary hospital in the region, for urgent treatment of casualties because they found that while one of the uh, eye surgeon was done the maximum number of uh, vitreoretinal surgeries for trauma in the world. And this study was approved by the Hospital Institutional Review Board and was carried out in accordance to the tenet of Declaration of Helsinki. And all patients were admitted to the Sri Maharaja Hari Singh Hospital, Srinagar between 18 June 2016 and 18th November 2016, and who had sustained ocular injuries due to pellets were included in the study. Demographics, clinical records, investigation results, and surgical reports were reviewed and clinical documents were reviewed and the following data were collected and uh, the nature of ocular injury was classified using the uh, pets. And then this is a video which shows uh, how I did. Uh, I'm using the 23 port pars and I use the uh, RTO 850, the 3D surgery, wearing the 3D glass and I don't have any financial interest, but the uh, reason I'm saying that is so here, this surgery was done using the Carl Zeiss microscope in uh, Srinagar, not the, but I, they had the, all the best equipment, the wide angle observation system. So I have, a, see, you can see the vitreous hemorrhage is being cut and removed. And I make a 11 to 12 uh, incision to, uh, once I identify the pellet, which is within the vitreous hemorrhage, I grasp it with the forceps designed by me, Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam and Dr. Uh, 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 Manish Bape from Nasik. So here I make an incision after identifying where is the pellet which is there in the organized vitreous hemorrhage. So this I make a conjunctival peritomy and then uh, I make an incision using the uh, knife and then enter through that with a, and without uh, disturbing the three ports. So this will be the fourth incision. I do diathermy on the scleral surface so that uh, can avoid bleeding and then 3.5 millimeter make a uh, liberal incision using the MBR blade so that uh, the idea is to uh, remove the foreign body without getting. So it's a four pronged forceps when you press the things open and then you grasp it like a basket and then remove it. So this is what uh, I have done. The idea is so that uh, the pellet does not remove, uh, gets out from the which is hemorrhage and falls on the retina and produces damage on the retina. You can see this retina is attached you can see sub uh, retinal hemorrhage in the inferior part and I removed the uh, pellet and now you see this is the pellet I'm removing. So I'm glad I went there every month for five days, worked from morning seven to night 11 p.m. And it was a back breaking, but thanks to my exercise uh, and also the dance, which made me strong, can continuously operate from morning to night. And I love operating. An operation is like doing meditation and uh, whether you get money or not, but you get satisfaction and blessing from the patient. Here, I did it totally uh, free because it was my duty as a fellow human being and a fellow citizen of India from uh, born in uh, near uh, Madurai, near Kanyakumari, the southern tip of India, working in Dharavi, the slums of Mumbai, and then going to North, the Kashmir. So I'm glad and you know, I have hair raising uh, experience because uh, here I've done the endolaser uh, barricading the, uh, creating like a coloboma of choroid, barricading from the submacular hemorrhage, the area where the, this was the area where the pellet went from cornea, sclera, then uh, lens, vitreous, and through the retina, uh, choroid, sclera, and out into the orbit. So finally, I do a sutureless vitreoretinal surgery, and then uh, this is another surgery uh, using the, uh, the same, same three four fast and uh, so again using the 23 gauge then uh, making three port then uh, the, this patient uh, if there's a retinal attachment I again prepare the retina so uh, the uh, ilia from uh, New York Times was there in the operation theater when I went Dr. Tarish, Tari Kureshi this was in 2016 he was very worried to have the uh, press reporters inside the operation theater because they were asking too many questions. But 
me as an expert and then since I was not from them and I came to help them, I boldly answered them. Because the first question I asked is, are all the patients blind? Will they get vision? So it was difficult for Dr. Tarek Hussain to, Tarek Qureshi to answer, but I said, I will do the best as anywhere in the world. I also took opinion from my friend Fernando Arielo from Johns Hopkins and the president of International Society of Ocular Trauma, Dr. Ferran Schoon. So, so you can see I'm uh, removing the organized vitreous hemorrhage. So Ferran Schoon taught me that we should do the primary wound repair immediately at, uh, as soon as the pellet injury happens. So I should congratulate Dr. Tariq Qureshi and 25 ophthalmologists working under him with three professors and maybe 10 residents and a few assistant professors and tutors have done a meticulous job of wound repair. And I think uh, it is like the signature surgery. The wound repair was, for example, 130 to 140 injuries happen at a time because it is a mob and then the pellets are thrown and then suddenly it comes and people with eye comes to the eye department casualty and they are admitted and there are multiple wards were there. So, and then uh, they have to be repaired. So they start uh, repairing from the time the injury happens till the, you know, all the 130 eyes are repaired uh, perfectly. So after that, within 100 hours, you do the second surgery, then I think uh, you can save the eyes. See, again, if the pellet has injured the optic disc, macula, or the center of cornea, then the possibility of getting vision is a problem. But if the macula is all right, optic nerve is all right, and uh, vision can come. There are patients who have got 6, 12, 6, 9, 20, uh, 20, 40, 20, 60, to some patient having hand motion close to face, and some may not, uh, some maybe go blind. And here you see, it is an uh, aphicic eye where, uh, and you can see again a three port pass plan of vitrectomy, making an incision. And then, as I told, you grasp the uh, foreign body using this forceps design, which is published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, which uh, uh, has been used. Uh, again, no financial interest. It, uh, it is made by an Indian company. And then, uh, this is, I think, the final video I have where, uh, so I have hundreds of videos which you have done, maybe thousands which uh, I wish is need not required. Hence, I've suggested the government uh, that we should do a center of excellence for vitreoretinal surgery, not only managing the ocular trauma, but also the various diseases, including diabetic retinopathy, which is rampant and which is going to be an uh, epidemic uh, explosion happening, which I think uh, we should repair and use this uh, technology uh, to repair or treat the vitreous hemorrhage and retinal detachments. So here again, uh, you're uh, doing a three-port pass vitrectomy, and then uh, you can, uh, some patients have a cataract. We also do a phaco uh, emulsification with a cataract implantation, lens implantation, and then do a vitrectomy and repair the retina. Some eyes, some eyes use oil, and some uh, we may have to do recurrent detachments of PVR where we go remove the oil, remove the membranes, and again, re use perfluorocarbon liquid, reattach retina. So it's a meticulous job, well done. And I think if it is done, and I think that's the best you can do to the patient and rest, leave it to the God. And I remember that every patient I told them, I will operate, whether you will see or not, we don't know. And if you are ready to for that, please come. But if you are asking for vision or guarantee, we cannot operate. And here you see, I clear the vitreous hemorrhage and some part of subretinal hemorrhage, I don't touch them. And then you grasp this for the pellet and then remove it through the superior incision and then continue the rest of the procedure. So this is the foreign body being removed. So finally close the sclerosis, close the conjunctiva, and then there's a 23 gauge fast plana that's also closed. So the results, a total of 771 patients, the mean age was 22 years. The problem was 15 to 20, there was no PVD. That was another challenge. So they needed an experienced surgeon like me to handle this. And there was a predominance of male gender, 97.7% because most of them who threw 
were pelleting stones, were a male, and most common age group was between 20 and 29, 397 patients, 51.7 percent, followed by age group of 10 to 19, about 284, 36.6 percent. These are the number of victims per age group, and this is the laterality. So binocular, fortunately, was in 6 percent, right eye 48 percent, 45 percent in left eye. So more, more than uh, uh, 94 percent were uh, only one eye. So fortunately, I had the fellow eye normal. So it still we repaired however bad the injury was because the idea was to use that eye as a step knee if the other eye has some problem in the course of lifetime. So this was an open globe injury in 73% and closed globe injury in 22% uh, and 5% the data was not available. So here bilateral open globe binocular injury among the six was 73% and 16% in one eye open globe, other eye closed eye. So visual acuity finding, the visual acuity data at presentation was available in 742 eyes from 703. 86.7% of the eyes had visual acuity of counting finger or worse, including 5.4% of the eyes which had no perception of light. And final visual acuity of the treatment was available in 734 from 697 patients. 17.6% of the eyes had visual acuity better than 6 by 60, while 82.4% of the eyes had visual acuity of counting fingers or worse. So this is what the uh, LA Times and then uh, New York Times and all the uh, Kashmir paper, Greater Kashmir asked me, is it worth operating? I said it is worth every surgeon's time. The reason is if you don't repair them, they will be blind. If you repair them, they will see. In where seeing can range from close to face to normal vision. And this is the pre and post operative visual acuity. Clinical examination uh, had uh, the, these are the slitlam findings, this is the indirect ophthalmoscope finding, CT scans, and this is the UCA ultrasound finding, and this is a clinical and image finding. So, time to surgical treatment and duration of initial admission, date of admission, and date of initial surgical procedure was available for 601 patients, a total of 529 patients, 88% admission operation on the same day of admission, and 64% had operation the next day, and duration of admission was available for 575 patients, and the mean duration of admission was 3.01 days. This is a treatment summary right from at primary repair, exploration, evisceration, vitrectomy, cataract, and discussion. Due to its perceived effectiveness, as well as its apparently reduced mortality rate, compared to traditional guns and weapons, pellet guns have been used to quell mass unrest in Kashmir. However, pellet guns are known to cause both life and sight-threatening injuries. These come are pump action and propel hundreds of small metal pellets or birdshot capable of piercing the body and eye. More than 90% of patients included in the study were young male under 30 years of uh, 30 years old, and this is expected because young male adults and adolescents consisted of majority of the protesters. And monocular injury accounted for vast majority, 93.7%. Majority, 68.85% of the patients in our study had open globe injury. And due to the high speed and small size, pellets most commonly resulted in penetrating or perforating globe injury or retain intraocular or intraocular foreign body. Pellet ocular injury can result in various anterior and posterior segment damage. In our study, traumatic cataract, high femur, which is hemorrhage, and retinal detachment are found in 126, 124, 223, and 11 patients, respectively. Conclusion, pellet guns, although generally less fatal than traditional ballistic-based weapons, result in significant ocular morbidity. The victims in this study were mostly young males, including those with bilateral eye injuries. The majority of casualties sustained open globe injuries surgical intervention was often necessary, and despite respectable injury to treat time, treatment times, visual prognosis remained poor. The dismal, dismal outcomes, high cost of medical care, and long-term visual rehabilitation process in these young working age patients impose significant physical, emotional, and socio-economic burden to both individuals and the society. In spite of poor visual prognosis, sur surgical intervention should be considered, and we should have the emotional support by psychological counselors appointed by the government to uh, make sure the patients are happy. And these are the references. And I thank uh, the opportunity uh, given to me for uh, doing this presentation of the world's largest uh, series. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer if there are any questions. Dr. Richard Packard.
Yes, um, that was very interesting, Professor Nataran. Uh, one has to ask the question, are there not better ways of suppressing crowds than firing pellets at them? Yeah, I know. I'm also thinking about it from 2016. It happened in 2019 in uh, uh, Chile, where they used the rubber bullet gun. And in uh, July 2020 in the US, sure. yes, but rubber bullet. It's similar to pellets. There are lots of other ways that we see on the news for people to suppress crowds with water cannons and all sorts of things. Uh, I'm not saying they're necessarily right. But certainly, this seems to be um, more than slightly uh, unnecessarily violent. Yes, yes, no, I agree. But uh, this is what is the problem the press wants to ask us. But uh, we don't have. I don't think we both have an answer. But I think we have to think as a citizen: how can we protect our own fellow colleague, fellow citizens from this? Because uh, by crowding is a problem. But they want to protest because they want to say something against the government or the ruling. And I think we have to allow that as a democracy, but it should be done peaceful. So I don't know how to teach both the, the protesters and the government that we should do something peaceful. And we had a Gandhiji uh, as an example of Ahimsa, where he, no violence, non-violent, he protested. He did salt, Satyagraha, had made a monumental uh, 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 collection of people all over the country by walking with the thousands of people. Same thing Nelson Mandela could do, but I don't know, the people are impatient and they want uh, something to be done and made their voice known. So we have to find a way to find, find uh, protect the eyes so that they can see well and at least be a, not a burden because if they're somewhere, I think uh, their productivity goes and if they are a poor person, it's a problem. Indeed, no, but you certainly have a unique experience now after the, the, the uh, yes the, the 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 experiences i i went there five months and uh, also interacting with the uh, officials the chief minister but uh, they are all uh, having their fixed idea that this is the only way to disperse crowd i still don't have an answer i'm discussing with the even with the aao and what do we do so i think one of the thing is uh, I, I, I had a, a regarding management of Corona in Mumbai, particularly the second wave has caused a lot of people having Corona and the municipal commissioner, I had a one-to-one -one webinar day yesterday. So he had a different way out of box thinking uh, to handle that. Something like that. I have to now talk to bureaucrats like him to find out what can we do to disperse a crowd and so I think water, water cannon is not a good idea. We have seen it's forceful and people have actually uh, had injuries to the eye also with water cannon. And uh, in Duke Elder, there's a book that uh, the fire hose, the fellow was looking at it and they, they actually did not have, uh, uh, the water was not there, but suddenly the water came and it water went into the force, removed the eye and came out. Uh, uh, the, 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 I don't know how it came, but it came off. So it, is, it, it was that much force. So I think accidents are, uh, they, these things happen when they're handling equipment as well as doing it. So I think uh, we have to have find some way to uh, do which is safer for the public and at the same time prevent this so that people like uh, surgeons like us don't have to spend time on injury repairs rather than when you have so much of diseases to tackle. Indeed. As you see, in, uh, Dr. Aaron says he said there is no place for violence in a democracy. And uh, certainly, I don't think the violence should be coming from the authorities. Yes, I agree. There is no second uh, uh, thinking on that. Yes. I hope uh, we both can do And I enjoyed your presentation. So you want to say something more about your presentation to the oh. audience? Not really, these things happen in one's life and you have to uh, deal with it as it comes. It was a remarkable period of time for me uh, to, to deal with somebody like this. And she was very appreciative. Uh, the, the vision improved to six over five unaided and it remained that way for uh, most of the rest of her life. So, you know. Uh, That's you really fantastic. Do. Yes, yeah. yes. No, I know. So I think the advice to the surgeon is I think you treat every patient the same. Don't be jittery and, and somebody comes to you. Well, 
the result of it was that a, a lot of VIPs came my way. So I had all the stress that uh, Bill Trantler was talking about of, uh, of dealing with these people and making sure that they got uh, good results. Although in fact, most of those were, were cataract surgeries rather than uh, vitroretinal procedures. Since I, I didn't, yes. after a, a while, I stopped doing vitroretinal surgery and concentrated on anterior segment surgery. Okay, so so I, I actually I only do vitreoretinal surgery. So I, in few years back, in a course on between sclerosis buckling, primary vitrectomy, and neuroretinal plexi, they asked me a question that if an actress comes to you, what which procedure will you do, and where uh, you you feel if a sclerosis buckling is apt, will you do it? I said yes, but as I said, she may get squint or uh, she may get something. But I said no. If you do the surgery well. Uh, the handle right from conjunctiva, septinon, and uh, everything well. And I know you cannot predict, but you, have, with your practice, you can aim at uh, perfection. You know, you, even though you cannot be perfect 100%, but you can have continuous improvement and produce, and have a say 20 by 20 and still uh, have 6, 5, and 5, and people are happy. And I have patients uh, with the 36 years follow up following slurred buckle, and you can't make out. The patient has got a steel buckle. So I, even today, I, I love to do a steel buckle if it is apt for that patient. And similarly, I had a patient whom I've done steel buckle, but had a PVR and a, a third surgery. So the patient asked me, you told me steel buckle, you have 90% success rate. And why I fa why my I failed? I said, hey, that's why out of 100, 90 will do well and 10 has a problem. He says, you're escaping by telling the fact he said. I said, no, that's a fact. That's what I told you the day before surgery. And I say, I, I discussed this pros and cons and not raise the expectation of the actress that I know, don't worry, I will give you a perfect eye and this. I will tell all this. There is a possibility of squint. There's a possibility of maybe sometimes the, eye, the eyebrow looks like this because of you're handling something and I looks a little red for some time. And uh, in spite of all the best, you may have to have a uncertain, uh, uh, you, you cannot predict in a uh, surgical uh, uh, procedure, even though 90% you can predict. Hope you agree with me. No, I do, but I mean, doing the informed consent in a logical and rational way is what our duty as a doctor is. We must always under promise and over deliver. Yes. I think that should be the lesson to everybody who's watching this uh, today. And uh, hats off to you for handling uh, a person like that. And great. And I think we are just 1.30. So thanks to the cake and pie. And in yep. case anybody have any questions for us, they can email us, I think. Indeed, I gather they will. So it's been a great pleasure yes. to be with you uh, today. Yes. Say bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.